mystery letter and tell us about the never-ending schedule of weekly events. So I thought. I think she's changed it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Please welcome our G Hook. Yeah, so I thought, you know, I'm gonna stop writing about death and dying, and then I thought, why oh, stop now? <laughs> <laughs> left the house, I stepped into the guest room to check on him, lying there in the hospital bed, his breathing unnaturally deep. I would not acknowledge the ever-present thought of, I can't do this anymore, but did allow a reasonable, hurry up and get out there so you can return before he wakes up. The last positive memory of before was us standing in our living room, surrounded by packing boxes as we decided what would go into storage and what would go into our suitcases the luggage we would take on our journey to the land down under. We'd been planning the sabbatical for almost two years with Hook saying the entire time, it'll be a once in a lifetime adventure in Australia. Yeah. So there we stood, placing well-packaged heirlooms into cardboard when his cell rang. I didn't even pay attention as he said hello. But when I looked up to ask why he wasn't helping, I realized he was still on the phone. No expression in his face, staring blankly ahead. I heard only, mm-hmm, before I walked over to stand in front of him, looking into his eyes for some clue as to the caller or the message, wishing even today it could somehow be taken back, the news that would propel us from planning a life overseas to planning to save his life. The thing about pancreatic cancer is everyone wants, everyone wants to tell you how fatal it is, and they love to share this with you as though somehow that's a comfort. After the first few times of contact with people who had lost their sensitivity chip or perhaps were never born with one, I retreated from the world of the living to one person's world of dying. The next 15 months were a lethargic nightmare where dusk is approaching but there's still enough light and yet vision is blurry, every step deeper into the waking dream. Even if we had been able to see, what difference would it have made? Day after day, week after week, was a catalog of treatments and drugs, schedules dictated by doctor's appointments and recommendations of don't do this and you need to do that. Most days as I awoke before the sun, I would hop out of bed, dress quickly in shorts and a t-shirt, and begin my trek down the street to beat the 110 degrees that would arrive too, too quickly in the day. In all of our walks together around the neighborhood before he was sick, those dogs were never there. But as soon as quashed hopes made an appearance, so did that rabid chihuahua and his musty sidekick, a white furball, whose meat yap was drowned out by the spastic snarl of seven pounds of evil. <laughs> if no offense existed, my ankle surely would have been gnawed by those animals as they cut through skin and tissue, biting until they reached bone. I'd forget about them every single morning until I walked into their line of vision and heard from a block away their ceaseless barking, which rose higher and higher the closer I came to the corner. Any serenity I built up in my head as an emotional escape began to disintegrate as soon as I heard their growls. They forced my attention from inside my mind to outside myself, and I could not only hear but feel both dogs' guttural temperaments, which desperately wanted to escape the confines of their yard and sink teeth deep into any part of my body, inflicting physical pain that could well match my mental madness. The longer our eyes, our eyes locked, the harsher the snipping, as though they could sense how much I hated them both, despised the interruption of the only release I would have that day. These barks represented everything wrong, wrong, wrong about this never-ending cycle of chemotherapy and radiation, surgeries and fluids, and all that goddamn pills and bandages. I hated those dogs for taking away our life, for the lack of freedom to come and go as we chose, to live wherever the hell we wanted. I hated them for our Australian journey being ripped away and a terminal illness taking its place. If I could have wrapped my hands around one of their bony necks, I would have choked it until the tumor left my husband's body, until all the anger for all of this happiness was gone, until the fear I refused to acknowledge of, what if none of this works? What if he just lives like this day after day, year after year after year? What if he doesn't? 
There was no person I could blame, so instead I looked to those dogs who represented the crossroads of, en of every endless hour of loathing and panic, silently wondering if I had it in me to stay until the end that never seemed like it was coming while dreading it would show without ample warning. And all throughout these days that fell on top of each other, the absolute terror of losing him would not allow me to see what the rest of the world could. How he withered from a healthy 165 pounds to a skeletal 97. And so the barking reached a crescendo as I came to the dog corner and turned left and out of sight. I walked until the elementary school came into view, the one with the half mile running track that I could stroll around and around and around until the dread of not really living lessened. Replaced by the love that got hidden under layers of sickness and caregiving. Clarity would return, so I could as well, to that house and to him and to some sort of compromise of peace to see me through the monotony of another day. When the morning sun felt too warm on my face and parents began dropping off their children, only then would I begin my return back, forgetting about those idiotic dogs who always saw me first, alerted me to their presence with the next round of barking. The walk back was crueler because at the end there was no escape, no walking away. There was only hour after hour of a routine made up of keeping watch for new symptoms or prolonged disintegration that I could report back to our hospice nurse, one of the few human interruptions allowed into our days. After he died, the dogs went away. It took me two whole walks by that fence before I realized they weren't there to test my endurance anymore. Now, when I could have used an infuse of emotion of any kind, when I would have welcomed the disruption of my nothingness, now they were gone. That's an upper. Yeah.